Um, so thanks. And actually, I want to begin this talk by thanking all of the organizers. So uh, thanks to Bob Bruner, Dan Isaacson, John Klein, and Andrew Salch, um, the organizing team at Wayne State University. Um, so, you know, thanks guys for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, so with that, I think I'm just going to get into the talk. So I am going to be talking about a computation in uh, motivic homotopy theory over the real numbers. And this is all joint with Dan Isaacson. So thanks, Dan, again. So all of this talk is at p equals 2. We've already had an introduction to motivic homotopy theory. Uh, so thanks to Dominic for that. Um, but I'm going to give a different introduction to uh, motivic homotopy theory, just kind of emphasizing some of the points that I'm going to be using in this motivic talk. And after that, so instead of getting into the details of the uh, computation with Dan, I'm going to talk about our uh, most important application, which is to the classical topic of Mahold invariants. So um, I'll introduce the classical Mahold invariant, and then I'll tell you how our motivic homotopy might help you learn about it. All right. So I'm going to um, get started with this introduction to or reintroduction really to motivic homotopy theory. So there are lots of good reasons that algebraic geometers like to study motivic homotopy theory. Um, but the perspective that um, Dan and I take in our project and the perspective that Dan takes in a lot of his work is that motivic homotopy theory is interesting because it's a useful comparison object. It's useful for comparing to classical homotopy theory and you can learn about classical homotopy theory through that comparison. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on comparisons among four categories, um, which is what you see on the screen right now. So in the bottom right, SH is going to be the stable homotopy category that we all know and love. And uh, on the left here, I've got two motivic categories. So um, I'll just start by briefly reintroducing those. So the idea, one way of stating the idea for motivic homotopy theory is, well, if ordinary stable homotopy is sort of a thing that you do to simplicial sets. I can think of motivic homotopy theory is a thing that you do to simplicial schemes. So I'll just say simplicial schemes. And C motivic means these are C schemes. And of course, you have to fix this up a little bit. You have to um, do a localization, and you have to stabilize. And there's a lot of technical details. But that's kind of the main point. So there are um, important functors here. So I can describe the horizontal functors. So if you have a scheme over the complex numbers, um, then you can take the C points of that scheme, and you'll get a space. So. you can uh, take that idea and, with more details, turn that into a functor between these two um, richer categories, and that functor is called realization. Um, and similarly, I can talk about uh, schemes over R. So that's what SHR is built out of. And there's also a realization functor there. So if I have an R scheme, um, I can base change up to C and take the C points. Um, And it turns out that, well, if I have a, an R scheme and I take the C points, then the thing I get out isn't just a space. It's a C2 equivariant space. Um, and so that's why this, this horizontal functor um, does, uh, do, does what it does. So um, this is also going to be called realization. OK, so that's two of the four functors here. Um, and on the left, I can do base change, so I can tensor up from R to C. And on the right, um, this is for getting the action. That's what makes this diagram commute. Um, all right, so uh, Dominic already mentioned that one of the most important features, at least computationally, of these motivic categories is that there are two kinds of spheres. So I've got a simplicial sphere, 
which comes from, uh, so uh, S10 is the simplicial S1. Um, and I've also got a, a S11, which comes from geometry. So I can take A1 minus the origin, so the, the affine line minus the origin, and that thing is supposed to look like a copy of S1. And if you get the details right in these constructions, then it will actually act like a copy of S1. So I can take smash products of these things and invert them, and I will get bigraded homotopy. So I'm going to write pi star star C um, for, for bigraded C motivic homotopy groups. And so similarly over R, I've also got an S10 and an S11. And actually, if I'm working C2 equivariantly, um, this is also bigraded. So S10 um, is going to be uh, S1 with the trivial action. And S11 is going to be S1 with the sine action. And all of these functors sort of do what it, you, you'd expect they do, um, given the grading that I've introduced here. OK, so another uh, important computational feature of these categories, if you want to compute anything, probably the first thing that you want to know is what's the cohomology of a point. So uh, classically, of course, the cohomology of a point with f2 coefficients is just f2. C motivically, so uh, uh, Dominic mentioned this, so the, the C motivic cohomology of a point with F2 coefficients is F2 adjoin um, this generator tau. And the realization map uh, takes tau to one. So this should be making you think of SHC as some kind of deformation of stable homotopy theory. Um, and that's actually true on, on a much deeper level than the simple algebraic fact that I've written down. So cohomology of a point um, over, over R. Is, so we've got the same tau um, that comes from motivic cohomology kind of more generally. And then we've got this other generator rho which I'll say more about in a second. And over C2, I've got, well, what it is, is it's the R motivic cohomology of a point, and then I'm just going to say plus more. And so this, this realization map um, acts as inclusion. And actually, I can say, more precisely what rho is in the C mode, uh, sorry, in the C2 equivariant context. So this rho is just simply the inclusion of the trivial sphere into the sine sphere. So this rho is going to be very important in the story that I'm going to tell. So one of the cool things about motivic homotopy um, is that for basically any construction that you're interested in, in ordinary stable homotopy theory, there's probably a motivic analog. So it's not just cohomology, although that's kind of where the story started. Um, we can also do things like the atom spectral sequence. So this has a algebraic E2 term. So classically, it's X over the Steenrod algebra. And it computes uh, the two completed homotopy groups of spheres. And um, there's an atoms, uh, the atom spectral sequence is a very general construction. Dominic went over um, actually how to make that construction. But the point is that that's something that I can write down in all of these contexts. So C motivically, this is going to compute uh, C motivic homotopy groups of spheres um, with a some completions. Um, so this has been extensively studied by Isaacson. So he both um, uses the comparison to the classical atom spectral sequence to help compute the C-motivic um, atom spectral sequence. And then the comparison also helps in the other direction. Knowledge of the C-motivic um, atom spectral sequence gives new information classically. 
So that's what I mean by um, using motivic homotopy theory as a comparison object. Um, over R, so there's also an atom spectral sequence. Um, and uh, computations of this spectral sequence um, is the subject of uh, the preprint with Dan that's on the archive. So um, just briefly, if people want to know how far did we get in this computation. Um, so in the paper on the archive, uh, there's complete information through the 11 stem. So I should clarify here, it's bi-graded. What do I mean by the 11 stem? I mean the information that corresponds via these comparisons to the classical 11 stem. Um, but I will note that there's, uh, in order to get that far, there's significantly more computation that's needed. So there's like partial information in uh, a lot of other degrees. And finally, so there's an atom spectral sequence computing uh, C2 equivariant homotopy. And this is a uh, work in progress by Guyu and Isaacson. All right, so sort of the story is that SHC is, is a deformation of stable homotopy, and there's an interchange of information there. Um, and SHR, you should think of as, as being somehow simpler or easier to compute with than um, C2 equivariant homotopy. So for example, like you can see this in the cohomology of a point, there's just kind of more there C2 equivariantly. And this plays out in the computations where, you know, if you didn't care about motivic homotopy, but you do care about equivariant homotopy, then <clears throat> that's a reason to study our motivic homotopy. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the Mahold invariant uh, classically, and I'll eventually get back to um, what this has to do with motivic homotopy theory. So what is the Mohold invariant? So it's a map from the classical homotopy groups of spheres to the homotopy groups of spheres. And it's a map with indeterminacy. So I'm writing R for this map because it's also called the root invariant. So this is non-zero. And um, kind of the summary of uh, why one might care about this map is that it takes, if you input into it um, elements in, in a part of the homotopy groups of spheres that you know more about, it will output elements in a part of the homotopy groups of spheres that is harder to understand. So it's kind of a, a handle on some of these harder classes. So for example, it increases step um, by a factor of between two and three. Um, and I'll say here that it, it usually increases chromatic filtration. So there's sort of some silly examples in low degrees where it doesn't, it sends two to eta. Um, but, uh, and this is, this is also sort of a conjectural statement. Uh, but the point is, say, say if you input the powers of two, um, then you get out the alpha family, which is V1 periodic. If you input the alpha family, you get out the beta family. And kind of the slogan is that the alpha family is much better understood than the beta family. So some names that I should uh, put here. Um, this is originally defined by Mahold and Ravenel. Um, and there's been more recent computational work done by Behrens. So what I'm going to eventually end up talking about is um, a variant on this construction. So first I'm gonna tell you how to construct the, uh, the, the classical Mahold invariant before telling you how to construct a variant. So actually the construction that I'm going to give is not the original one. Um, there's an equivalent construction due to Bruner and Greenlees. That's easier to uh, generalize or I guess modify in the way that 
we would like to do. So this is something that you do with a diagram involving homotopy groups of spheres. So if you look at the C2 equivariant homotopy groups of spheres, um, there are two ways to get to, to map back into non equivariant homotopy groups. Um, so I could either forget the action or I could take fixed points. And the kind of fixed points I want is uh, geometric fixed points. And I'm going to denote that by phi. So the other part of this diagram that I'm going to need is uh, remember, remember rho. So if you don't remember rho, I will remind you what rho is. Rho is the inclusion of the trivial sphere into the sine sphere. Um, and that is, so I think I introduced it as a cohomology class. Uh, oh, okay, well, I guess, sorry, I just told you that it's a homotopy class. So um, I can look at this tower uh, multiplication by rho. And so what this uh, Mahold invariant construction is going to do is I'm going to start with a class in uh, ordinary homotopy groups of spheres. And then I'm going to think about all the ways to lift over fixed points. And I want to take the most row divisible lift. Um, so by the way, there's a little degree thing that um, I'm going to sweep under the rug until we get to the examples. So um, at that point, so maybe my row divisible lift looks like rho to the n times something, where the, the something, the y, is non row divisible. So we're going to lift it somewhere up in this tower um, such that it can't be lifted anymore. And then we're going to apply this forgetful map. And the class that I get out is going to be the Mahold invariant. So there is indeterminacy in this construction because um, most row divisible lift, um, there might be multiple elements that are uh, equally row divisible. So this has to do with uh, row torsion elements. Okay, so just a brief example. Um, I'll have a more uh, thoroughly explained example later. Um, if you start with two, then the class here is eta. You can think of eta as a, a C2 equivariant element. Uh, and this is not row divisible. And if you forget, it turns out that uh, you also get eta back. So the Mahold invariant of two is eta. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the classical Mahold invariant for the time being. Now I want to talk about a variant of it that involves motivic homotopy theory. So this is going to be a map that starts with classical homotopy groups of, of spheres and there are kind of two ways I could think of it. I could either think of it as a map that outputs C motivic homotopy groups, or I could think of composing it with the realization map and think of it as outputting uh, classical homotopy groups of spheres. So there are kind of different situations when we want to think about um, these different perspectives. So I'd like to say it's non-zero. But the best I can say that it's is that it's non-zero as a map to chi star star c, um, and it's sometimes zero after realization. So that kind of provides a simple answer to the question that's probably in the back of your mind, which is like, do they agree? So they don't always agree because it's always non-zero classically, and it could be zero. Oh, typically, um, but I claim that this is still interesting in part because it agrees with the classical one in many interesting cases. And I'll have more to say about that later. So, construction. So, this is also um, in that preprint. 
uh, with Dan on the archive. So the idea is to make a similar diagram as the one on the left, um, except also get motivic homotopy into the fray. So I can start with the R motivic homotopy groups of spheres. And I have two ways of um, mapping to ordinary stable homotopy groups. So this uh, uh, diagram in the box um, is kind of a summary from the, the first slide of this talk. So the square is the square that I talked about, and then I've added to the picture um, uh, that I can also take fixed points. So I can map to ordinary pi star of s um, by taking uh, realization and composing with fixed points, or I could map to ordinary stable homotopy um, by going around the square. So I'm going to write this as going around the, the top right path around the square. So I can end up with first C2, and then I can forget down to pi star s. So what this construction does is you start with an element in ordinary stable homotopy groups of spheres. You think about all the possible lifts, and you take the, the most row divisible one or ones. And again, there's a degree issue that I'll get back to. Uh, oh, sorry, I should have drawn the, the row towers. So row, um, row I defined as an element um, in C2 equivariant homotopy, but it's also an element over R. So I can make both of these towers and the towers map to each other. So here I am with my element row to the n y. I can uh, divide by row as much as possible. And end up with some class that I can then map to C2 and then forget. And then I end up with some class that I'm going to call RR in uh, ordinary pi star dus. Um, OK, yeah, I think I, I forgot to, to put the notation. So I'm going to refer to, I'm going to use notation a little bit, use RR for both the composition and for the map to, to C. I'll mostly be thinking of it as the composition. Okay, and I should also mention um, how this relates to work of Quigley. So um, uh, Quigley defined a motivic Mahold invariant um, described uh, differently, but I believe that it's equivalent to doing a similar construction, but with C2 equivariant, C motivic homotopy instead of R. The reason that we decide to, uh, sorry, was I, was I muted? Yeah, you got muted for a second, but I just unmuted you. I, it was only for a couple seconds, so. Okay, um, right. I don't know how that happened. Um, okay, so so uh, I'm just comparing to to Quigley's uh, motivic Mahold invariant. Um, we choose to work with R because it's easier to compute with. Okay, so these diagrams seem you know hopefully you believe me that this is something that that you can write down. Um, but you know, what does it actually do? What does it look like in practice? So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk um, going through two examples. So I'm going to spend most of my time on an example in uh, low stems that um, actually ends up being a case where the R motivic Mahold invariant does not agree with the classical Mahold invariant. And I hope that this exercise will help give some impression 
about what are the possible things that can go wrong. And at the end, I'll talk about uh, some positive things we can say about when this does work. So the takeaway point that I'm going to try to illustrate is the way that these constructions can fail to agree um, essentially has to do with an element could lift higher in the C2 equivariant tower than in the R motivic tower. So if you just sort of look at these pictures um, and, and maybe let that, that idea stew around a little bit, uh, this connects to the example that I'm gonna give. So, okay, so I've summarized up here the diagram from the previous slide and the steps in computing the hold invariant. Uh, so we're gonna start with some, some element X. Step one is to find uh, the most row divisible pre-image. And then step two is to divide by row, lift it up the tower. Um, and then step three is to forget. So um, we're gonna do that for X input being the class 16. But first I have these pictures and I need to orient you to what these pictures mean. So first, um, so this picture here, um, this is part of the uh, R motivic atom spectral sequence. So what's drawn here is part of the R motivic stable homotopy groups of spheres. And over here, uh, I've got part of the C2 equivariant atom spectral sequence. So those dots all represent um, some of the uh, uh, C2 equivariant homotopy groups of spheres. So next, I'm going to elaborate on that part of. So what, what part do I want to talk about? So first off, this direction in the spectral sequence is atoms filtration. So that's not going to be too relevant to our story. Um, this direction um, on the chart is stem. And uh, what's relevant to us is that if you have a class in stem S, and then you forget, then what you end up in is pi S of the sphere. And finally, we have this phrase co-weight to zero. Um, and what that means in the context of this talk is uh, if you start in co-weight zero, and then you do the fixed points map, then you end up in uh, pi zero of the sphere. So there are these two ways to map back down to non-equivariant stuff, and you end up in different degrees um, based on which, which of these maps you take. So, um, okay, so the next feature to point out is I labeled a couple of these classes, H0 and H1 on each side. So you should, if you're somewhat familiar with the beginning of the atom spectral sequence, you should think of those as the familiar H0 and H1. And uh, one feature to point out is that in both of these cases, H1 is a non-nilpotent element. So just as a reminder, H1 is the algebra name for the class eta. Um, H0 uh, is a little more complicated. So um, uh, maybe I'll just leave that there. All right, so the next thing to point out is what are the red arrows. So rho is in degree um, minus one zero in these pictures. And so what that means is multiplication by rho goes one unit to the left. And so whenever I have these arrows, really what I mean is that uh, there's one row multiple here, and then there's another row multiple here, and here, and here, um, and so on. So um, one can think of it as that, like, there's this whole tower of rows. So by the way, that tower is not supposed to go through the blue class. They're supposed, it's like supposed to pass over. Um, so I can think about all these uh, row multiples of the classes on the diagonal. And similarly on the other side, I can draw all these row multiples. And so those are all 
rural local classes. So um, because this is important to the later story, um, I'm going to mark which classes are row local and which ones are row torsion. So the row local classes I will highlight in red. So that's basically everything in these tabs. Um, and on the other side, um, something interesting happens. So the dotted lines in the C2 equivariant tower um, are hidden row extensions. And what that means for us is that that's a, so that's a multiplication by row. And so the tower starts to the left. So these things, that's all one tower. This is all one tower. This is all one tower. And then I have more, I have more row towers. Okay, so that was, that was all the row local classes. Um, and there's also some row torsion. So um, the, these classes on the vertical axis that I've colored over, um, those are not part of the row towers. Those are um, row torsion elements. So I've got some of these same row torsion elements and then all this extra stuff c 2 um, on uh, that stuff is also row torsion. Okay, so why do we care about what is row local and what is row torsion? Um, the first step in finding the Mahold invariant involves uh, finding pre-images over geometric fixed points. And as I've notated here, what geometric fixed points does in these contexts is it sends row to one. So if you take um, an entire one of these row tasks, say each, each of those red lines, you're supposed to think of as like a F to a join row, and it sends it all down to one class. So the bottom row tower all goes down to the single element one. So degree wise, um, it's, it's going to be uh, like projection to the y-axis kind of. So, um, so remember coweight zero means if I do phi to it, I end up in uh, pi zero of the sphere and pi zero of the sphere is um, what I've drawn. So the only thing there is that tower on the vertical axis. So um, I'm working too locally. So that's why I've labeled my elements in pi zero of the sphere is just powers of two. So that's what happens to a, a row tower. It goes to the corresponding um, element in pi zero s under the fixed points map. And of course these row torsion classes all get sent to zero. So maybe now is a good time to start the example computation I wanna do with this. So I want to show how to compute the Mahold invariant, the R-motivic Mahold invariant, and the classical Mahold invariant um, of, of the class 16. So I'm going to start with x equals 16 and pi 0 of s. Um, and so the first step is to find the most rotavisible pre-image. And so here's the part um, where I need to do something with degrees. So find the most row divisible pre-image, I'm just gonna say in the right degree. Like you might've been worried that like if I have this whole uh, row tower, then you, know, there, you have as much divisibility as you want. So really what I need to be doing is looking at um, uh, pre-images in stem zero. So I'm not gonna say Y zero, but that's, that's what it is for this one. Um, so actually, if I wanted to look at all of the classes that got sent to 16, it's this entire tower that gets sent to 16, but it turns out that I only want to look at that one particular degree. And well, I've, I've colored over that box too many times, but there, there are only two things in that box. There's something in the tower, um, so h1, h1 squared, h1 cubed, h1 to the fourth. So there's going to be a row multiple of h1 to the fourth in that box. 
So there's um, row to the fourth, h1 to the fourth is there. Um, and there's also a, an, an, a row torsion element sitting under it. So I could also add that. So that, that row torsion element was h0 to the fourth. So I could add that. And those are the two things um, in that degree that get sent to 16 when you invert row. OK, so the thing in the tower is divisible by row to the fourth. And uh, the other one is not row divisible. So I'll say divisible by uh, row to the zero. Um, and well, I'm supposed to take the most row divisible lift. So I'm going to take that one. And I'm supposed to divide by row as much as possible. So I'm going to divide by row to the fourth. And I'm going to get h1 to the fourth. So the last step is to apply the forgetful map. So in general, um, it's actually pretty complicated to figure out what this map does. Um, and that's, that's just a different story that I'm not going to tell today. But in this case, one way to think of it is that the forgetful map is trying to map this to h1 to the fourth in classical stable homotopy. But classically, that class is just 0. So essentially, what I'm claiming is that the output of this R motivic behold invariant is 0. So that's sad. That's not going to agree with the classical one, because the classical one is supposed to be um, non-zero. So we're going to watch now what happens C2 equivariantly if I do the same computation. Um, and hopefully, this will give you some intuition about uh, where the comparison goes, goes differently. So we're going to start with, with 16. And OK, so I've got 16. And I'm trying to lift. So all of the things that map to it is going to be this entire tower. Wait, uh, one, two, one, two, three, four. Sorry, I got the wrong degree. Let's try that again. Um, three, okay, yeah. So the things that lift to it is that entire tower. And if I'm going to look at just the things in the right degree, I'm looking at the things right there. So the pre-images in stem 0. So it's going to be the same things. So row to the fourth, h1 to the fourth. And then I could also add a row torsion class. And well, the difference here is that this time, the row divisible class is divisible by more rows. So that was the point about this row tower kind of snaking around due to the hidden extension. Um, so let's, let's count how many copies of row it's divisible by. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I can backtrack seven spots in that tower. So this is divisible by row to the seven. And the other class is still not interesting. So I'm going to pick this class. And this time I get to divide by row to the seven. And well, I don't have enough names in this picture that I copied. Um, but I'm just going to call this the pink class. So um, at least this is going to be in the seven stem. And if I forget, I'm at least supposed to get a class in the classical seven stem. So that's already different from the degree that we were sort of uh, aiming for before. Um, The, the actual class is 8 sigma, and it's non-zero. OK, so I got different answers um, 
for these different computations. And the point that I'm trying to make is um, basically the reason that I got a different answer is that one of these towers is longer than, than the other one. So if we could somehow guarantee that in some other situations, certain towers of interest have the same length, then we would be able to conclude that these invariants do agree for those particular classes. So um, let's see, I'll just summarize. So the R motivic Mohold invariant would be equal to the classical one if, well, okay, so if this, if these two entire pictures were the same, um, then things would be okay. And more hand wavily, I could say that if um, the pictures are the same near the bottom of the relevant row tower. Like the problem is that one row tower was bigger than the other one. So this is why we studied um, comparisons between uh, R, R motivic homotopy groups and C2 equivariant homotopy groups. So it turns out that there's a region where they agree. So this is first studied by uh, Duggar and Isaacson and the bounds were recently improved um, uh, with Guillou and Isaacson. So if I'm looking at the by degree SW, then these homotopy groups are going to agree if 2w minus s is less than 5. And um, there's an exceptional case that's kind of uninteresting. OK, so how does this region compare to the picture? So above um, this region is in stem strictly less than 5. So that's telling us that it agrees in stem less than or equal to four. Um, so that hits the bottom of the R motivic tower. Um, but there's room for, so they, they don't agree in the five stem. And um, that, that allows the tower to continue to the right um, in the C2 equivariant case. So we're kind of off by one, like if this, you know, well, okay, so, so it is true that they don't agree. If the bound happened to be pushed one more to the right, then they would agree. However, there are many interesting cases that do fall inside this isomorphism region. So the thing I'm gonna leave you with is um, this lovely picture in, so co weight seven means that if I do fix points to it, I end up in pi seven of the sphere. So this picture is the R motivic picture that will help me compute um, the Mohold invariant of sigma. So sigma lives in the seven stem. Um, so I've highlighted, so the, the green region is the isomorphism region from uh, the theorem on the previous slide. And I've highlighted in yellow um, the appropriate row tower that's involved in doing this computation. So this time, the row tower li lives entirely in the green, in the isomorphism region. And moreover, the isomorphism region also extends like one square to the right. So it's not possible for the C2 equivariant tower to have more row divisibility. So the R motivic computation um, tells us that the R motivic Mohold invariant of sigma is sigma squared. So I'm not giving all these details. I'm just pointing out um, uh, which, which Mohold invariant we're working with. And um, because it's covered by the isomorphism region, this tells us that this agrees with the classical Mohold invariant. Um, and that's good. So this recovers uh, a computation that was originally due to Mohold and Ravenel of this classical Mohold invariant. All right, so thanks for listening. 
Okay.